Wendy Hartsock, science and peptide enthusiast. In this episode of Exploration Science, I met up with Dr. Adam Dewerfeld. He's an associate professor at the University of Minnesota and also a co-founder of Exitent Therapeutics. We're joined by his co-founder, Dr. Henry Shin. They discuss the logistics of founding a company out of academic research, as well as their work towards targeting diabetic retinopathy with the activation of PPAR-alpha. We also learn more about Dr. Dewerfeld's research into understanding molecular patterns of bacterial permeation, as well as the atomic interrogation of azole Depsy peptides. Maybe we could start just with some backgrounds, you know, um, uh, Henry, maybe you could start with, with your background and then, and then Adam, you could give yours. Yes. So um, my name is Henry Shin. I am co-founder and CEO of Excitant Therapeutics, which um, I co-created with Adam and Dr. J. Ma. Um, my background um, is from physiology. So I did PhD in physiology under the mentorship of uh, J. Ma. And I studied uh, eye diseases. Uh, so that's how I first began my research career in the eye field. At the time, I was working on human uh, genetic disease that affects the, uh, a very small number of people around the world, but there is um, no cure for it. And I was very interested in that project and um, ended up kind of developing my passion for eye research that way. But being in grad school, I mean, there were a lot of uh, um, downs, <laughs> then ups. <laughs> so a lot of the times I pondered, like, what's the meaning of my research? Like, how does it actually, you know, turn out to be uh, relevant to society out there? So I've always wondered, um, like, how what we do on the bench top becomes relevant um, to people out there outside of the lab. So towards the uh, end of my graduate career, I began to think about industry connection. Um, I wanted to see how the science translates to uh, a drug product. So that was something I uh, slowly began interested in. And then um, towards the end of my school, uh, I chat with Dr. Ma and uh, told him, this is kind of career I envision. Um, I want to kind of stay away from academia <laughs> and uh, uh, I think I was at the right place at the right time because uh, Dr. Ma was also thinking about um, a uh, potentially commercially viable project. So um, that's how we uh, began to um, lay grounds for excitant therapeutics early on and working with Adam at that point, um, we the three of us really began to uh, collaborate and uh, that's, that's how Excitin uh, began. But my background coming straight from graduate school, and then I did a uh, postdoc also with Dr. Ma, just so that I can learn more about the project and lay grounds for Excitin. And here I am now. So, <laughs> <laughs> nice. Yeah. That's okay. um, and I do want to talk about sort of the going through that path from academia to to you know, co-founding this company. But but Adam, I'd like to get your background um, as well. Sure. So um, born and raised in Iowa, um, I went to uh, my undergraduate education was at a smaller Bellarts College, um, Central College in Pella, Iowa, and um, had a little bit of research experience there. Um, really, just enough to get my feet wet and know that. I, I wanted to uh, pursue a, at least a, an advanced degree in research and went to the University of Kansas in, to do my PhD in the medicinal chemistry department. That's where you and I met, of course, um, overlapped at KU. And after, so at KU, I worked with uh, Brian Blagg and uh, most of the focus there was on developing isoform selective inhibitors of a um, certain heat shock protein. At the time, we thought that would be useful for anti-cancer therapies. It turns out that, um, it, it at least as of right now, it's not all that it wasn't. It's not all that useful, um, but it has some implications in the eye. And so, that's a little bit ironic that you know my graduate research made that transition from right. from cancer to the eye, um, maybe a little bit fortuitously. Um, and then after KU, I did a, 
my postdoctoral research with Dale Boger at the Scripps Research Institute. And, and that research experience was really focused on the total synthesis. Um, we were working on um, some variants of bleomycin that we would hope would, would lack um, the, the fibrosis aspect of bleomycin. Um, and then uh, after Scripps, I started my independent career at the University of Oklahoma in the Department of Chemistry and Biochemistry. Um, that's, of course, where I crossed paths with J. Ma and Henry, and we started collaborating on on this um, project for retinal diseases. And, um, you know, I, I think the only other thing I'll add here is, you know, the, one of the major reasons that I decided to go into academia is because, you know, it really does provide the opportunity to do basic research in an academic setting. So pursue your own research ideas, but then at the same time, uh, you can translate some of the discoveries that you make. And so you get, you get some experience in, in the pharma and industry side of things as well. So, yeah. um, yeah. Awesome. So then, yeah, maybe we can talk a little bit first about excitant um, therapeutics, um, what the, the um, disease states that you're, the you programs for. And then, like I said, I really want to talk about the, the, the pathway of how you both got to, to where you are to being co-founders of the company. Yeah, excitant therapeutics is focused on developing um, drugs for eye diseases, of course. And our primary target is diabetic macular edema. It's a complication of diabetes where uh, patients would develop microvasculature problem in the eye. And what it ends up being is like a leaky garden hose, if you will. So blood vessels become leaky and they will leak blood and fluid, which then end up being uh, accumulated um, in the eye. So when that happens, it detaches the uh, retina from where it's supposed to be. So it, it, it compromises the integrity of the tissue. So that way, um, our vision is also affected. Uh, imagine film of a camera is all like wonky. So you can't get a uh, proper focus. Um, so um, that's one of our main indication right now. So um, patients, um, with DME typically receive um, anti-VEGF injection, which is a biologic drug that uh, they have to inject directly in the eye once a month. Um, and uh, it has been working remarkably well for um, I think past a decade um, in, in the field, but what, what people are realizing now is that uh, not only it's very expensive, but also it's very um, limited to a narrow scope of uh, um, action. So it's targeting one molecule. So um, targeting one molecule for a very complicated disease such as DME, because there are many aspects of uh, pathogenesis involved for DME, um, there is limited efficacy. So um, as many as like 40% of patients may not respond well to this drug. Um, and the only other option they could uh, resort to is uh, laser therapy. So um, laser photocoagulation would basically help cauterize the uh, blood vessels that are leaky, but at the same time, it leaves the irreversible damages to the uh, retina because it's literally just burning it off, right? So patients may lose a uh, peripheral vision due to uh, laser photocoagulation, et cetera. So, um, our treatment options are really not um, ideal for sustainability for long-term, um, particularly for diabetic patients because they it's a chronic disease. So um, we are focused on developing oral drug. So uh, we are trying to develop a safe uh, oral pill or tablet that can address the problem without having to inject eye um, at all or not as often so <laughs> i have to say that that's something i find horrifying the the eye injections it just yes. i can't imagine so because yeah, i can't even touch my eyes with uh contact lens and <laughs> I, I can't imagine <laughs> getting in yeah, it's, it's it's kind of funny because you know you talk to the the clinicians the people that administer the the treatments and you talk to some of the patients as well and you know i i Apparently, the treatment actually is not painful or anything, um, mm -hmm. but it's when you when you aren't part of that world and you hear about the treatment. You know, I when I teach when I teach our medchem course, mm -hmm. 
here to pharmacy students, you know, this is one of the stories I tell um, in terms of our, our research and how we do, you know, structure activity relationships and those sorts of things. And I always bring up what we're trying to do and what current treatment is. And you see, you see some students a little squeamish when you talk about eye injections, but um, yeah. Yeah. I'm, yeah, I'm squeamish about it myself. <laughs> um, so, you know, I was, I was reading some articles. Thank you for, for sending those links, by the way, um, about sort of the way that um, the molecule, I guess it was already in the, the, your lead molecule, I guess. It looked like it was in a clinical trial. So it had a unique path of how you found your, your lead compound for, um, uh, for this company. Can you talk about that a little bit? So to clarify, our compound yeah. is preclinical stage. Uh, okay. So it ha mm -hmm. has not been tested in clinics yet, but um, rationale is where we uh, uh, were inspired by clinical yeah. trials that have targeted the same molecule. So um, we are going off of uh, a two large clinical trial um, that used a drug called phenofibrate. Mm -hmm. And these two trials, Field and Accord Studies, they have tested phenofibrate um, for its effect on cardiovascular outcome in type 2 diabetic patients. Mm -hmm. uh, but what the two studies have found serendipitously is that Phenofibrate was working remarkably well for preventing um, worsening of diabetic retinopathy progression. Mm -hmm. um, and having to receive first time laser therapy in those populations. So uh, unfortunately that the issue with the phenofibrate though is um, there, it, it is um, not the most potent and selective compound for PPAR alpha. Uh, so PPAR alpha is the molecular target we're going after. And phenofibrate is a, uh, a moderate agonist of uh, PPAR alpha. But uh, in terms of selectivity and potency, it's not the, the best that's out there. So um, phenofibrate inherently exists, uh, it exhibits uh, dose limiting toxicity. So what if patients uh, need uh, more dosages of phenofibrate to have a greater effect in the eye? Now, other parts of the body that's uh, exposed to a higher dose of phenofibrate may become an issue, especially a uh, kidney, for example, if you have kidney complications, which is common in diabetes, right? That's, that's a no go, right? So um, that's where our rationale came from. So why, what if we can improve that aspect uh, of PPAR alpha agonism? So target it, target PPAR alpha with more specificity and make it uh, more potent. And um, that's where our lead candidate came from. So um, we, are, we have tested our lead candidate in various disease models of uh, diabetic retinopathy or uh, diabetic macular edema features uh, in those models. And it looks very promising in terms of um, um, reducing uh, vascular, uh, vascular effects in those diseases where they're uh, leaking a lot of blood in the retina or where they're developing uh, pathogenic neovascularization, which is abnormal growth of uh, microvessels in the retina. Um, we're able to uh, uh, reduce that as well. So our, our lead compound, um, in short, is a, uh, a much better version of mm -hmm. uh, what's available out there. And um, Adam will talk more about it. Uh, he can talk more about it, but like, chemically speaking, like it's a unique structure. So it's not, not uh, a part of uh, what's known as a fibrat class molecule. So our structure is completely novel and it's not re really related to uh, a drug that's existing out there. It just targets the same protein, but much better. Okay. Before we get into some of the, um, the structural aspects, maybe could we talk a little bit about targeting um, PPAR alpha and, and what that, how that pathway influences the yes. eye disease? So PPAR alpha is very uh, pleiotrophic. Um, it's working upstream of what's currently being targeted in the field. So what current standard of care with anti-VEGF is targeting is obviously VEGF. It is the molecule that's responsible for uh, blood vessel growth. Um, it is physiologically relevant. I mean, it helps blood vessels to grow where it needs to, et cetera. But um, in 
pathogenic condition, it becomes out of control. So there's abnormal levels of VEGF available, and that's what triggers uh, uh, the vascular leakages and vascular uh, growth, et cetera. So our molecule is actually working upstream of that um, VEGF molecule. So our observation, it it regulates uh, many different aspects of the disease that involves inflammation. Um, it also involves the uh, angiogenesis, and it also involves uh, uh, neurodegeneration and um, antioxidative effect, uh, as well as uh, antifibrotic effect. So there are a lot involved in this process, but PPAR alpha works upstream of that. So it regulates inflammation through um, what's known as NF-kappa B pathway, or it can also help mitochondrial function. Uh, so it, it kind of restores that function. So, so it would help with the uh, um, um, general, like happier homeostasis, um, if you will, of, right. of uh, retinal cells. And also it affects the wind pathway, which uh, can help regulate fibrosis aspect or um, angiogenesis aspect. Mm -hmm. So yeah, it's pleiotrophic effect. And it's very like surprising because one, one target can, can touch many things like this mm -hmm. without limited toxicity. So yeah. So I, uh, I, yeah, I just to mm -hmm. add quick, sorry. So, you know, this was one of the exciting, th the things that excited me as a, as a somebody, you know, interested in translating drug discovery research is, mm -hmm. you know, when you think about the patient population that's unresponsive to anti-VEGF, you know, perhaps the reason that they're unresponsive is because their disease is being driven more by the inflammatory factors or the fibrotic factors, you know, not everybody's disease uh, pathology is the same. And so, you know, this is, as a company, this is one of the things that really excites us is, you know, we're still hitting VEGF. Um, so we, we still have, we, we will still be, hopefully be able to cover that patient, that portion of the patient population that responds to VEGF, um, or at least provide some sort of, um, you know, amplification of, of, of that treatment, maybe lengthening anti-VEGF treatment or something like that. But the real excitement comes in the fact that we're modulating these other pathways that drive the pathology of the disease. And maybe that will help us address those patients that don't respond to anti-VEGF. So that, that was really what sort of grabbed me as a, as a drug, you know, a, a dream drug developer, right? Yeah, so. yeah. yeah. And so, yeah, I mean, I think it'd be, I, I, like I said, definitely want to know more about the molecule, but also, um, yeah, as a modulator of, of, inf of inflammation, um, I guess that'll be kind of fun to design your biomarker studies and, and see like what, what specific cytokines you're upregulating, downregulating. And uh, yeah, I can see getting very excited over that. Yeah, it's interesting you mentioned that because there's a foundation that we've um, had some discussions with, um, and they are very interested in developing biomarkers for retinal diseases. Mm -hmm. And you know, we haven't we haven't moved forward, um, you know, in in terms of collaborating collaborating with them or anything. But there's some definite interest out there in yeah. looking at the biomarkers of these diseases. Right, right. That's great. All right, talk to me about these molecules. Okay. Um, uh, so maybe just, you know, we'll back up a little bit. So, you know, the, uh, this was a pretty unique situation, I think, in that I was actually contacted by the Office of Technology Development at, when I was at the University of Oklahoma mm -hmm. and said, hey, we have a researcher at OU Med um, that is interested in, you know, targeting these, these retinal conditions. They've identified a molecule um, that is, it's a known molecule and they're looking to make new intellectual property, you know, is this something you'd be interested in working on? And at the time, you know, my group, I think I was in year two of being a faculty member. And so, you know, of course you're looking at bringing on these new projects and things. And, um, so we had some meetings with Jay and, and, um, you know, he shared the structure with us and it's a, it's a, it was a very tractable structure as is. And, and we did some in silico studies, um, uh, you know, some docking studies, some modeling studies. And I was convinced that we could, we could turn this thing into something that was more selective and more potent. And, um, you know, so put us, put a couple of students on it and sort of ran with our structure guided design, um, um, emphasis and, and, um, you know, a couple, couple of years later, we're, we're sitting, you know, 
about 30 nanomolar and cell-based assays uh, with a lead compound. And we have, you know, uh, over about 3,000 fold selectivity. Um, and just to put that in perspective, uh, phenofibric acid, which is the active metabolite of phenofibrate that interacts with PPAR alpha that, that showed clinical efficacy um, is about six fold selective for PPAR alpha. And um, it's, it's cell based, it's cell potency is about 25 to 50 micromolar. Um, That's a you know, so, you want to throw out. <laughs> Yeah, exactly, exactly. So we got to start somewhere. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, so yeah, that's that's sort of the you know the short end of the of the story. So, right. Oh, that's great. Yeah. So maybe, um, like I said, I wanted to talk more about the the path to going from this academic setting to um, actually founding a company together. Um, so, uh, can you talk a little bit about how this has happened and and maybe some learnings that that you've uh, received from it <laughs> yeah maybe i can start on this one henry and then you can you can chime in um yeah so you know i think um i think we moved probably quicker than um than is probably normal um so <clears throat> so we we uh turned to patent um the the compounds rather quickly so the first patent was actually method of use um, and that was because the the initial compound that was identified was actually part of the NCI library, um, so it was a known compound. Um, and then eventually we got to our to the structures that that are novel um, and and filed the composition of matter. Um, and then we we actually had some pretty significant interest um, um, in terms of um, the IP, and and so that's where we we kind of made the decision at that point, well, we need to start a company and license the IP so that we have a, we have a, a company formed that we can actually start to, you know, work with some of these companies that are interested in eye diseases. And um, that ended up, you know, that interaction ended up not being as fruitful as we thought it would be, um, or at least moving in the right dire the direction that we thought it would. So here we were with a a company that licensed the molecules and you sort of scramble, right? Because at that point, you know, you, you, you can't really continue the development because the, the molecule has been licensed to a, uh, to a company. So, you know, we turned to, um, uh, so promoted Henry from postdoc to CEO and, and started writing SBIR grants to, mm -hmm. to fund the research so that, so that we could keep moving things along. You know, fortunately, um, around the same time, we were awarded an R01, so we could continue the basic research mm -hmm. in, in the academic setting. Well, one interesting point is that, you know, at the time I was pre-tenure and everybody that I was talking to was saying, you know, don't start a company before right. you get tenure. Don't do it. Don't do it. It's career suicide and all these mm -hmm. things because it looks like your focus is, is spread, you know, mm -hmm. between two different entities. And, you know, I just reminded myself that the reason that I got into academia was so that I could pursue these sorts of things. That's, that's why, that's why I'm here. And, and so I, yeah, I said, well, let's just do it and see what happens. And I'm glad we did because, you know, I think things are moving along pretty well. So. Yeah. What was the most important, I think, decision that you made that allowed you to do that? Was it, you know, being able to really rely on Henry? Was it like, what were the, the things that, that really helped you be successful? I think, <clears throat> I think it's a very st strong collaboration and we all get along very well. Um, you know, I think the, this, the team just, um, I don't think knock on wood, I don't think we've ever had a conflict or disagreement. Um, you know, and, and so, you know, when you think about the area of expertise that we cover, um, you know, it's basically from computational design all the way through preclinical, mm -hmm. um, evaluation. So it, we basically had the expertise of a startup company to begin with. Right. Um, and then you bring on the fact that, um, you know, Henry was still active in the lab. And so we had a, basically somebody that could carry out the important experiments to help us advance the research. So I think all of that played in, played in uh, to make, to, to get us to where we're at. So it sounds like, so maybe you guys all sort of came together to decide that Henry should go into the role of CEO, but Henry, had you sort of had maybe aspirations of this prior or? So Full disclosure, I never imagined myself to be an entrepreneur. <laughs> I always imagined myself to be a happy, happily employed person somewhere uh -huh. in the lab. <laughs> um, 
So yeah, this was not something I aspire to, but um, I grew I grew to love this role more and more as I was actually doing it in the scene. Mm -hmm. um, so in postdoc uh, era, um, when I was working with Dr. Ma and Adam, um, the idea of creating something from academic lab was very, very appealing. Like mm -hmm. All of a sudden, it just kind of became a thing for me, right? So as I was growing my interest in industry, how these drugs are developed and how they get delivered to patients, all that aspect, like I imagined ourselves as like one of those uh, frontline uh, effort, right? Uh, so um, it just happened organically as I was um, taking some of the compounds from Adam's lab and testing them um, when I was working with Dr. Ma. Um, I saw how these molecules work and now it became a patentable material. And now we're actually going to do something about it with uh, like commercial effort. So um, yeah, I mean, that's how it all played out kind of naturally. And uh, we started to um, worry about the finance aspect of it too. Because like, like Adam mentioned, now we have all these uh, uh, compounds licensed to company, but now what? <laughs> How do we actually develop it? <laughs> so um, I've learned about the uh, SBIR mechanism. So mm -hmm. um, uh, it was very helpful to have um, expertise in-house because not only I have um, MedChem um, from Adam, but also Dr. Ma has years and years of experience in the uh, research topic, as well as the grant mechanism itself. And I also had uh, help from local community. Um, like around the time we started to build a company, I think, I believe in my opinion, my, my personal observation, I think Oklahoma Metro um, area was really beginning to build infrastructure and start investing in uh, people who are pursuing life sciences venture. So um, I had wonderful resources from local community to help me with SBIR writing and get their feedback. It, it just makes our team um, that much stronger. So yeah. yeah, that's how we were able to get continuously funded through, um, uh, through the beginning, I mean, from the beginning, through where we are now. And just to throw it out there, uh, as of last night at like 2 a.m., I got an email saying that we got awarded SBR phase two funding. Congratulations. Yeah. So, thank you. That is awesome. You could, have, you could have told me that before this. I mean, so, so Wendy, <laughs> just, just, some, just some backstory. We, <laughs> we sort of knew that this was coming, but we didn't have the official notice of Board yet, so you're just breaking oh, the news wow. to me too, Henry. So that's amazing. <laughs> yeah, it just okay. happened last night. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I, I do want to just re-emphasize uh, emphasize what Henry said, you know, and I, and I, I thank you for bringing this up. We would never be where we're at as a company if it wasn't for the help that that University of Oklahoma provided. I mean, they have um, an OK Catalyst program that is meant to help uh, not just local companies, but national companies um, compete for SBIR grants. And so they proofread, they help you write commercialization plans. You know, they, OU um, uh, has a student organization that helped us basically look at our market value, our, our, our market sizes. Um, you know, so I think this is really one of the benefits, you know, your listeners might find this um, interesting in that one of the benefits to developing IP in a university is that you have this support network to help you get to the next stage because as scientists, I mean, really, we, we may have taken some classes or something on how to commercialize things, but when you get in it, in the thick of it, yeah, you, you really have nowhere, no idea how to proceed. And so they're definitely a big part of, of why we're, we're at where we're at. Right. And can you also just maybe for people who aren't very familiar with SBIRs, can you guys talk about those grants and sort of how they work in the different phases? Um, so America, it, I mean, SBIR is known as America's seed money and it is run by, um, and I, I mean, it is run by different agencies, but NIH is one of them. So DOD also offers it and uh, uh, different agencies have their own SBIR programs. But um, 
we went with uh, NIH SBIR programs. So um, it is generally a two-phased uh, program where phase one would be for proof of concept. Um, so you can take your idea. Uh, if you have any preliminary data, that's great. They advertise like you don't need data, but I, I don't know how true that is. Uh, it's always more compelling if you have something to show. Uh, mm -hmm. But phase one is for proof of concept. And uh, depending on the result of uh, phase one, then you can proceed to uh, phase two, which is focused on commercialization aspect of it. So like, what do you need to do before you can take it further and close it uh, closer to the market? So phase two is usually uh, larger in size, but it also demands a lot more uh, in terms of uh, team strength and in terms of your uh, roadmap, uh, et cetera. So different programs have different uh, focuses. Some are just like investigator solicited. Some are like topic driven. So they would uh, put out their interest topics. Um, but in our case, we were going after National Eye Institute mm -hmm. and our uh, research area is always of uh, um, unmet need uh, field. So yeah, that's uh, where we targeted. SBIR, I mean, you just have to be a like, legit company based in based in the States. And mm -hmm. um, um, there are all these uh, like re eligibility criteria, but if you are like just um, a genuine US company, uh, don't have like too many employees, then then uh, you can you can uh, sell your idea and uh, pitch your idea to uh, SBIR and get funded. But it's yeah. a very competitive program. Um, it's a very competitive program for us. Even our study section, uh, we're competing against not just vision, but we're competing against uh, um, like auditory and uh, um, med uh, med tech uh, devices and diagnostics and etc. So it's. It's really a free for all type um, competition. So, uh, yeah. Again, congratulations on getting the, uh, the phase two award. That's awesome. Yeah. So um, what, what's next for, for Excitant Therapeutics? For us, um, mm -hmm. we are, uh, our imminent plan is of course to complete the phase two project, which um, will take our lead asset further um, down the development path and closer to IND filing with FDA. Um, and uh, that is really the uh, uh, huge, I mean, the number one milestone for us right now to achieve. So that involves IND enabling studies and of course, prerequisite uh, safety and tox studies in animals before we can push it to human. So that's where um, our focus is uh, fixated right now. Great. Likewise, likewise, though, you know, we're always interested in quick plug here. We're always interested in those that are interested in what we're doing. So, um, you know, I think eventually we'll, we need to get to the phase where, um, you know, we have some private investment coming in. Um, you know, we've been very fortunate, actually, that we've been able to bring the IP along as far as we have with non-dilutive funding. Um, but to, we need to continue, you know, to grow the company and and get private equity so that we can continue to build our leadership and, and those sorts of things. So um, I think that's, you know, another big phase for us that we, we are, are starting to, to tackle now. So yeah, I appreciate you mentioning that. <laughs> Investors take note. <laughs> <laughs> well, is there um, anything that uh, I didn't touch on for the company aspect that you, that you wanted to people to know about? Mm, we are, um, primarily driven by a single molecule right now, um, PPAR alpha, but it has um, really a whole host of application um, possibilities. So we are focused on eye uh, aspect right now because I and Dr. Ma, like we <laughs> we both are eye researchers, <laughs> but. Um, Application is uh, definitely possible in other therapeutic areas. So uh, we're also looking to venture into uh, different organs, if you will. And we always uh, want to 
welcome an idea to uh, discuss a possibility of uh, collaborating and uh, especially in liver um, or kidney, uh, things like that, that has to do with diabetes. It's, it's of a huge interest to us. Great. How about you, Adam? I think the only thing I would add is just, you know, maybe a sentimental uh, uh, pitch here and that, you know, we, we all have, we, we will all be affected by these retinal diseases at some point, either, either personally um, um, or have people in our family or, or things like that. And, you know, that was another thing that sort of attracted me to this science is, um, you know, you start to think about, I think, I think I read somewhere recently that uh, vision uh, is responsible for about 80% of our sensory intake. Right. And, you know, when you put it in that perspective, anything that you can do, I think, to, to make a difference is, is going to be huge to people's quality of life. And I think, you know, this is, this is really why, you know, we, I think most of us are interested in drug discovery is, is because, you know, you're, it sounds cheesy, but at the end of the day, you want to make a difference and, right. and, and translating discoveries, academic discoveries, um, especially, um, is, is one way to do that. And I'm just, uh, Henry, I'm super excited that the phase two finally came through and, and, uh, and yeah, so congrat, I want to congratulate Henry on, he's the one that wrote the, the phase two proposal. And mm -hmm. so, uh, congratulations to, to Thank Henry. You. Yeah. Um, yeah, I'll say just something to the, um, the 80%. I don't know if, when you were kids, if you ever played like the, the sense game where you would like figure out like what scent, like even as adults, right? Like what sense would you let go first? And for sure for me, I mean, and I think everybody I ever played with like sight was last. Um, and not to say that, you know, like there aren't compensating features for everything, but, but yeah, I, I think that's for me definitely like what is the scariest thing to, to think about losing. So, yeah, I would agree with that. And then you yeah. think about the videos of people where they put something like behind a box and they're just feeling and they try to tell you what it is. Right. Oh, I mean, no. how many people can get that right? It's not, you know, so it's a, it's a serious thing. And right. Yeah. So, yeah. Absolutely. Great. All right. Well, um, yeah, again, congratulations, Henry. That's awesome. On the, on Thank the you, front. Wendy. Yeah. So, Adam, I know we were going to sort of talk a little bit about your academic research. Um, Henry, you're Welcome to jump off. You probably have to go write more grants and find more investors. <laughs> uh, also, welcome to stay. It's, it's All right. Okay. Thanks for having me. It was nice meeting you, Wendy. Oh, you as well. All right. Thanks for joining, Henry. No problem. <laughs> Thanks for inviting, Adam. Yeah. You guys have a great talk. See you. Indeed. Bye-bye. Bye. So, you know, Adam, I was looking through your um, list of publications on the website, and um, I saw a familiar name. Uh, that's Yushan Lin. And yeah. there's actually she is in one of the episodes um, that I did for this um, this podcast. And and I love her. I mean, she's also going to be at my GRC as a speaker and, you know, we're working on <laughs> projects together. So, yeah. Uh, but maybe you could just start with just giving an overview of all your different research programs that are going on in your lab. Yeah. So, first of all, I actually... Um, uh, actually, Yushan was the was the podcast that I checked out uh, oh, okay. when, you, when you contacted me for this. So, um, yeah, so she she's incredible. By the way, I actually just contacted her the other day to to see if we could follow up on some of the studies that oh, that we previously published. Mm -hmm. So, awesome. um, but I forgot to mention that I was doing this to her, so I'll have to check back in. Um, <laughs> yeah, so we we um, we're mainly focused in in two areas, uh, so retinal and infectious diseases. Um, you know, so, so we've heard already about the, the retinal, uh, disease interest. And so I'll, the only thing I'll add to that sort of bin of projects is that, you know, we're interested in a number of different, uh, targets. And so once I started to get in, you know, to the, to the PPAR alpha research, it became very apparent to me that there are, you know, multiple pathways as we've already talked about that drive these diseases. And, um, you know, it would be, it would be good for us to, to start to investigate some of these other targets in, in the hopes that we could develop oral medications that can, that can treat retinal conditions. Because, you know, as Henry already mentioned, the standard of care is, um, is there, there's evidence uh, popping up that shows that it, it actually causes, you know, for chronic diseases, it can cause these irreversible effects, scar tissue, blind, you know, peripheral blindness, those sorts right. of things. So, um, 
And now that we have, you know, sort of a, a mass spec method and proof of concept that we can deliver our PPAR alpha agonists um, systemically and that they show up in the retina in concentrations that are meaningful to uh, or, or that are, are necessary for to, to drive the efficacy, you know, that sort of excites me as a medicinal chemist in that there is a way for us to get molecules to the eye through systemic administration. And as long as we develop molecules that aren't toxic, of course, the biggest trick in the book yeah. Um, that there's a way to do this. And so we're interested in pursuing other targets and we're trying to, um, we're trying to push some other targets to, to the same stage that we have for PPAR alpha. So that's our, our, you know, retinal interest. And then the other interest we have, as I mentioned, is an infectious disease. And there's really two areas there that we're interested in. One is very basic research. And, and this project is focused, it's an NIH fun, funded project. It's a collaboration with Memorial Sloan Kettering, University of Oklahoma, uh, us here at the University of Minnesota, and then um, uh, Merck. And the whole goal of that project really is to try to understand the properties of molecules um, that dictate whether or not they get into gram-negative bacteria. Mm -hmm. And we kind of want to do this in sort of a target agnostic way. Mm -hmm. So to start with, we're, we're even looking at molecules that aren't antibacterial, we're just interested in, do they get into gram negative bacteria or not? Mm -hmm. um, and the reason that we want to understand this, of course, is because it's very easy to identify molecules that work on bacterial targets in a biochemical setting. Mm -hmm. But as soon as you try to, or as soon as you evaluate those compounds in a whole cell setting, especially against gram negatives, their activity just falls off because mm -hmm. of the, the dual barrier system and efflux pump system that they have. So if we can understand the properties that influence whether or not molecules accumulate in gram-negative bacteria, the idea is that we can start to develop these medicinal chemistry um, tools like a topless tree or Lipinski rules or mm -hmm. these tools that will help us rationally design molecules to get into gram-negative bacteria and therefore we can develop new antibiotics. So that's you know more basic research. Um, and then the other set of projects that we have ongoing is I'm fascinated by the idea of overstimulating pathways in bacteria mm -hmm. and determining if there's a therapeutic effect or a therapeutic value to that. And the example that I'll, I'll give to this um, is, you know, if you think about the human heart, we're very aware, we're very aware of the fact that if you shut off the human heart or inhibit its action, that there's a detrimental effect on the organism. Yeah. Um, I, what I think we underappreciate is, or underestimate, is that you get the same exact effect if you overstimulate the human mm -hmm. heart, right? And, yeah. and so one of my interests is, can we identify targets like that in bacteria that if we just push them over the tipping point, um, there's a therapeutic and antibacterial effect that's mm -hmm. associated with that? All right. Excellent. So um, one thing that I was thinking about when you're talking about for the, the permeability studies was that not only is that, you know, useful to find maybe antibacterial agents, but also like crosstalk agents, right, between bacteria. We like study the microbiome. And so I, I, I really appreciate that. I think that that will go well beyond your, your antibacterial agents. Right. Yeah. So, so we have a lot of, you know, it's interesting you say that. So we have a lot of, you know, now that I'm at the University of Minnesota, there's there's research um, going on here um, that looks at cell-to-cell -cell communication. Okay. Uh -huh. um, and so we're, we're very interested in pursuing some of these ideas. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Very cool. And then for the, so for the other aspect, um, what targets are you looking at specifically for overstimulating uh, bacteria? Right. Yeah, so we have, we have two targets of interest right now that we at least have data on and that, that we have been pursuing. So one is a a bacterial protease called caseinolytic protease P. Um, it's often abbreviated CLIP-P. Um, and so as you would imagine, you know, this is a protease. And so we can, and others, of course, can stimulate this protein with this protease with small molecules. And it basically, <clears throat> basically results in a, an unregulated uh, peptidolysis of, of uh, polypeptides as they're you know, formed on the, on the, formed in the cell and they just get chewed up and it basically causes bacterial cells to eat themselves from the inside out, mm -hmm. um, which is an example of turning something on and killing right. bacteria. Um, and then the other target that we've uh, recently published on actually in collaboration with Stan Spinola out at Indiana Meta um, 
is a two component signaling system. So um, these are, are systems that bacteria have that basically take outside uh, signals and then transmit them to an inside message basically. So they're very much like our, um, you know, uh, uh, kinase signaling systems mm -hmm. in, in, in our cells. Um, and in this uh, project, this um, we're interested in a two component signaling system called CPXRA. And uh, we have small molecules that act, that activate this system um, and basically render uh, um, pathogenic bacteria antivirulent. Mm -hmm. And so we have animal data now that shows that if we administer compounds in a, um, a UPEC model um, in mice, that we can clear um, the urinary tract infection. Uh, from mice. And so this is another, in this case, we're activating a pathway and it's not killing the bacteria, mm -hmm. but it's turning off their ability to infect. And then the, the natural system clears right. the bacteria. Yeah. And so are these also, you know, as you're looking in the antibacterial space, are you also thinking about translating that? I mean, are you looking with Merck on the, the more discovery side, but for this, are you also, is this something where you could foresee yourself like like a hero sugat where you have like company after company after company or? I think, you know, I, I would love to continue to, uh -huh. to, to spin things out. It's a lot of work. Yeah. Um, cool. So, but yeah, I, you know, I think the infectious disease space is one where, especially as academicians, we're sort of, you know, we're sort of obligated yeah. to, to continue this work because, you know, as you're, as you're well aware, you know, a lot of the pharmaceutical companies have sort of backed out of, antibacterial development because of, you know, revenue issues. And, you know, so as, as an academician, I feel almost obligated to mm -hmm. at least help in the identification of new molecules, um, try to help with the understanding of molecular properties and how, how it influences penetration and accumulation. At the end of the day, one would hope that there will eventually be more mechanisms where when you develop something that can be translated mm -hmm. that there will be money to do so right um, right yeah so yeah. something else that i saw you know as you kind of had brought this up earlier of sort of the, the serendipity of having studied the hsp uh was it 90 uh chaperones mm -hmm. and then looking now at, at the, the retinal disease but also now even thinking about what you're doing with um, antibacterial agents there's a lot of crossover, right, between the oncology uh, research that you've done and, and these others. What has been kind of the most exciting sort of surprise for you as you've gone through these different fields? Um, surprise. Um, or, or just something that popped up and you were just like, okay, that, you know, it, it's so interesting that there's crossover in this capacity. Yeah, I think, you know, I think one thing that, that, Brian uh, Blagg, um, just for the, the viewer's reminder, my PhD advisor, um, you know, one of the things that I think he identified in terms of my interests when I was a second or third year student was, you know, I, I still remember having a conversation in his office where he said, you know, you seem to be really interested in resistance and, and trying to understand and deal with that from a, from a medicinal chemistry perspective and molecular design. And, you know, so I think, you know, maybe it's not all that surprising, but what's really interesting to me is, you know, how resistance um, seems to be the ultimate evil in, in both of these, um, you know, conditions and in, in cancer and infectious disease. Yeah. Um, and, and then I think the, maybe the other interesting thing is, you know, when you think about cancer, we have a tendency, of course, to group all of the cancers under this term cancer. Um, and, you know, that's dangerous because, you know, the, all of these cancers behave differently. Right. And when you, when you think about that from a drug design perspective, you know, oftentimes you can have a good molecule that kills cancer cells, but at the end of the day, does it get to the organ or the tissue that where the cancer resides and is problematic? Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, then when you sort of, think about that in a, in an infection, mm -hmm. um, setting, you know, it's, it's kind of similar. Like we, we, we 
we, we kind of group all of these infectious organisms under this, oh, you have a bacterial infection, right. but then you have the difficulty of, you know, does the compound that you're making, does it, does it address the bacterial infection that you have? Mm-hmm. And does it get to the site of action that you need it to get to? Right. Right. So as you mentioned, there's a lot of similarity actually yeah. between these two areas. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. And then the other thing um, that I noticed is that you've expanded your molecular repertoire. And so I saw some um, publications with uh, some peptide based molecules. Uh, can you talk a little bit about just just generally what what uh, modalities you're interested in? Because you've mentioned being modality almost agnostic for the, the permeability studies. Sure. Yeah. So this um, that project is really born out of our interest with um, the protease, the bacterial protease that we activate. And so, uh, you know, the molecules that you're talking about are, are cyclic acyl depsipeptides. Um, so, um, you know, they're natural products and derivatives thereof. And our interest in that um, class is really focused on, you know, I think this is my takeaway from one of my many takeaways from, from Dale's lab at Scripps is, you know, single atom alterations can have a very dramatic effect on uh, the biology of of compounds, their stability. Um, And so we're very interested in in, uh, interrogating um, atoms within that scaffold that we think uh, can drive and can improve biological activity. Mm -hmm. And so this is really our total synthesis project um, in the lab. and, And we have, I think, we have some pretty cool molecules in that series that should be coming out here pretty soon. Uh, we're just collecting the, the final biology on them. So fingers crossed, but nice. yeah. Excellent. All right. You know, we, we can't get away from peptides. You know yeah. that. <laughs> no, I mean, I, my world, you know, obviously is, is peptide. And, and that was one thing when I started this podcast that I did want to sort of expand my horizons as well. Right. And, and, and jump over that, that, that peptide wall, but yeah, you're right. It's, it's so intertwined. It's the same thing with the oligonucleotide and peptide. Like they're, those two are forever bound. And, and, and that's just true of biology and, and chemistry. And I love yeah, ab- Absolutely. And, you know, when you think, when you think back to just science in general, like, you know, there's, there's a, a great paper about why nature chose, chose phosphine. Um, and, you know, and, and you can say the same thing for any of these building blocks for any biological material, there's a specific, reason why nature chose these chemotypes right. and in fact even in the accumulation study that we're doing we have a library um, of molecules that we're generating that are linear peptides mm-hmm. um, but then we take those same peptides and we cyclize them mm-hmm. so that they're, they're you, you could argue that they're non-peptidic non-peptidic peptidic anymore <laughs> Um, and so we're looking at the effect of, you know, what does conformational constraint of, of, um, dipeptides and tripeptides do to the ability of these molecules to accumulate gram negative bacteria? And can we leverage that in in, in any fashion? So, yeah, that's fantastic. Well, Adam, was there anything else that you wanted people to know about your research or? I, no, I, I just really appreciate this opportunity. Um, you know, rarely do you get, you get an opportunity to talk science with somebody who, you know, you, you cross paths with and overlapped with in graduate school. So this is cool. Yeah. Awesome. Well, thank you for your time. I really, I appreciate it very much. Yeah. And I look forward to catching up at ACS and, and chatting a little bit more, but again, thanks for reaching out to me, Wendy. And this has been really fun. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks for tuning in to this episode of Exploration Science. As always, we welcome your feedback and suggestions for topics that you'd like to see covered. You can leave those suggestions in the comments below or tag us on LinkedIn. You can also find this podcast available as a YouTube series by searching Exploration Science. Thanks again for tuning in.